After World War II was over, Germany was basically partitioned. And what you'll see is that it was divided up into basically four parts. You had the American side, the British side, the French side, and then you had the Russian side over here. In the aftermath of World War II, and this actually does now get to the point where we're talking about the Cold War, as I mentioned, Russia had suffered 20 million casualties in World War II, and they basically had said to themselves, you know what, 20 million casualties, that's way too much. We are not ever going to put ourselves in this position again. So not only was Germany effectively divided up, but what you'll see is that they dropped an iron curtain that basically ran down through Europe. They dropped an iron curtain that ran down through Europe. And if you've ever heard of the Iron Curtain, the countries that were to the right of this or in Eastern Europe basically fell under the jurisdiction of the Soviet Union. The countries that fell on the western side of this actually fell under the jurisdiction of the United States. What Moscow said in dropping this Iron Curtain was they basically said this, if anybody ever decides to try and attack us again, if anybody ever tries to attack us again coming in this direction, we don't want the fighting on our land where maybe Moscow is or some of these other cities or where their oil was. We want the fighting to take place in Poland or maybe in Romania or maybe in Czechoslovakia at that time, which is divided now based upon this map. But the bottom line is we want the fighting to occur in other people's countries so we can prepare ourselves so that our land is not ever going to get hit again. This was really the beginning of the Cold War. Nobody had suffered losses in World War I and World War II like Russia. And so the idea was, was that we are going to go ahead and we are going to divide Europe up and ultimately we're going to divide the world up so that we, the Russians, are going to control certain things. The Americans over on the other side are going to control certain things. And we're not, granted, these were the two main powers in the aftermath of World War II. The Soviets were, were a big deal because obviously they had taken a lot of territory through here and it kind of created created some puppet countries. The United States was a big deal because it was the unquestioned winner of World War II. No bombs were dropped on American soil but for Pearl Harbor. And in the grand scheme of things, as far as property damage, as far as lives lost, as far as anything, the United States not only didn't lose, but it made gargantuan amounts of money and profit and ultimately rebuilt an awful lot of Western Europe. An awful lot of Western Europe. So basically what you've got here is the world was divided. And basically you had two camps. You had the Soviet camp, which was considered the communist camp, versus the American camp, which was considered more the, the democracies, if you will, the free market economies, if you will. And what you'll see is that as they divided things up, if the U.S. and the Soviet Union began to get into conflicts, they would actually fight not directly against each other. They wouldn't fight directly against each other because the world had already suffered two serious wars in, in basically a generation. And when you think about the lives that were lost and whatnot, nobody could really struggle with that. Nobody could really cope with that again. So their argument was, we will now fight through other countries. We will basically, if the United States backs country A, the Soviet Union backs country B, we'll maybe give them military advice, we'll give them military equipment, we'll provide training for their troops, and we will almost fight and compete against each other in these other countries indirectly rather than actually firing shots at each other. When you sit down and you think about the Cold War, this in a nutshell is basically what the Cold War was. It was a situation where the United States and the Soviet Union basically were playing chess. There was a move and then there was a counter move, but they were never directed against directly against us by the Soviets or directly by us against them. They were basically set up so that it were other countries and we would be able to stop this before it got too big, before it got too out of control. So you've got this bipolar world. If you look at Europe, you'll hear a term um, in the power politics chapter, and that term is known as balance of power. If you look at the Europe map in the aftermath of World War II, what you'll see is that you almost had Europe equally divided. You had this western half, if you will, and I'm going to take the Germany line off. So you've got the Iron Curtain here, you've got these Eastern European countries that are on this side, you've got Western European countries that are over on this side. Basically, you divided Europe in half, so the Soviets had their half, the Americans had their half. 
The trick with the idea of balance of power was that if Western Europe really thought that they could defeat Eastern Europe in a war, then they would have gone in and taken them. And vice versa, if Eastern Europe thought it could defeat Western Europe, they would have gone in and taken them. But let's face it, you fight wars because you think you can win. And if power is balanced on both sides, then what you're going to find is nobody is going to want war because frankly, we don't really know that we can win. And if we don't know that we can win, there's no point in fighting. That's really the trick behind what balance of power was. So you've got this balance of power thing going on first and foremost. You can also make the argument that there was something that was known as imbalance of power. And the chapter mentions this, and this is kind of a tricky concept. When you go back and you look, if you added up all of the American allies, and not only the number of the American allies, but their wealth, and their military, and their world stature. If you took Britain, and France, and the bulk of Germany, and Spain, and Italy, and then you took uh, the United States, and, and you took various countries, and you put them together, this was a very formidable side. This side would have won had the Soviet Union pushed too hard. The idea behind imbalance of power is the Soviet Union, because they were on the side that was likely to lose, was not going to try. They were not going to try and do anything because they knew that if they would have, under imbalance of power, all of these other countries would have been able to crack down on them. Yeah, it's true. You've got Poland and maybe Czechoslovakia and Hungary and Bulgaria and countries like this that are over here in Eastern Europe problem was, was that these weren't the wealthiest or the most militarily powerful countries in the world. So really, if you compared Britain and France to Poland and Bulgaria, for example, Britain and France would have been far superior. So when you look at the Cold War, a couple of things. Number one, the whole idea of bipolar. You are either with the United States or you were with the Soviet Union for the most part. It was a bipolar world, and you had to basically go to one of those two. There were a few countries that kind of towed the line and remained in between, but basically they were both trying to recruit other countries to their camp. You had balance of power. If you've ever heard of North Korea and South Korea, because they're still in the news, if you've ever heard of Western Europe and Eastern Europe, basically what they did is that the United States never won and the Soviet Union never won, but effectively they would tie. And if it got to the point where things would begin to get out of hand, they would divide it up almost halfway and they would create that term balance of power so that both sides would have something tangible. Now, if you looked at it in terms of the bigger picture, that's where you get into that imbalance of power. And again, the idea of imbalance of power effectively is this. Again, if one side has way too much, then one side, say the Soviet side, which because they didn't have as much strength, were not going to challenge too hard because they knew that they were going to lose. The problem with the logic of imbalance of power is that if the Soviets knew that they were going to lose, then the Americans must have known that they were going to win. So if you think that you're going to win, technically speaking, you're going to try and attack. But they never did. So imbalance of power maybe isn't as perfect of a definition of balance of power was. One last thing to think about, and I'll leave you with this. The, basically, the end of World War II was brought about by the United States dropping two nuclear weapons on Japan. Germany at that point had already been defeated, and Harry Truman, who was the President of the United States, was given several options. His first option was the United States could just surround Japan, blockade them, and gradually starve them. They could gradually have their energy resources run out, and they could gradually weaken the country to the point where Japan would want to surrender. Problem with that was it was going to take a long time. The United States could have invaded Japan. And if they invaded Japan, the military estimates were that the United States would have lost one million soldiers, suffered one million casualties in an actual attempt to invade the island of Japan. Now, when you consider that we had only lost not even a million soldiers in every war in American history, this was not an acceptable option. So what did we do? We nuked Japan. We dropped two atomic bombs. And these two atomic bombs that completely annihilated cities 